indebtedness is not just a consumer problem, it's also a political problem. But will more banking regulations actually help fix the problem? Well, the G20 and the European Financial Stability Board seem to think so. INSEAD Professor of Banking and Finance Jean Dermine is not so sure, and he joins us today on INSEAD Knowledge to explain why. Welcome to INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you. Okay, what are these new regulations on international banks? So following on the 2007-09 crisis and the big losses taken by banks, uh, around the world new regulations are being imposed. And to simplify that today, three types of regulations. One is regulation on capital, increasing the equity level of banks. Two, very strong regulation on liquidity, making sure that if money flows out of the banks, banks would have liquid assets to meet cash outflow. And three, a discussion of corporate structure, and in particular whether investment banking activity would be totally separate from regular banking activity. That's a little bit like Glass-Steagall. I mean, are we going back to the 1933 U.S. Banking Act or what? So as regards the issue of corporate structure, indeed, it's a debate very similar to Glass-Steagall, where the U.S. are taking a stronger view to, to push some activities like hedge funds, private equity, proprietary trading, totally out of the banks. In Great Britain, there's still valued synergy between banking and investment banking. That's why banking group would be allowed to conduct both activities, but they would need to put investment bank in a, in a separate subsidiary. The idea is that if there are losses in the investment bank, that investment bank could default, and therefore uh, we will not have any more the too big to fail doctrine applying to investment banks. So one would fail, and the, but the retail bank would continue. Right. The idea is that we want to keep the bank alive, to keep lending to the economy, not to hurt depositors. But to say if the investment bank goes into default, this is a problem for the economy. Now this is what the uh, Vickers Commission believe. Mm. However, personally, I'm not, not at all convinced because if you see what happened during the crisis. Uh, number one, the losses in countries like Iceland, Ireland, Spain had nothing to do with investment banking activity. It was pure regular banking, Mortgages. too much lending on the real estate mortgage market. Even in Great Britain, the first bank that got into trouble, Northern Rock, again had nothing to do with investment banking but was classical lending. Two, we saw what happened in the US first when Bear Stearns was in trouble. The Federal Reserve did not dare to let Bearston go bankrupt. They arranged a merger with JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. and then finally in September 2008, they decided to let Lehman default. And we know that created a huge crisis in the world. So I'm not at all convinced that the British authorities would dare to let a large investment bank default. Well, that lesson's been learned with Lehman. I mean, that, that, that created a crisis and, and confidence among the banks. So I, I think exactly, they know that already. Exactly. Therefore, therefore, at least my opinion on this issue of corporate structure, uh, it is as, as it is today, I do not believe it will succeed. And, and the example, it was not only Lehman. Already in 2008, when LTCM, the very large hedge fund LTCM, was in trouble, they did not dare to let LTCM default. There was a package organized by the, the Federal Bank of New York. So therefore, I think we, we need much more than just this issue of separation. Now, uh, the, one of the reasons we're talking today is because you've come out with a paper called Banking Regulations After the Global Financial Crisis, Good Intentions and Unintended Evil. So how come, since the crisis was so severe, everybody has been calling for more regulations? It seems welcome. Why is this unintended evil? Why are you objecting? It is an intended evil because I believe we are addressing just a, a symptom. So there was a crisis. Banks had too little equity to absorb losses. When depositors started to run away, there was not enough liquid assets. Banks had to call on central bank, on government. Therefore, massive, in my opinion, overreaction of regulators. We are going to force a massive increase of bank capital. Two, we are going to force banks to hold liquid assets. So for me, this is another reaction because we should not forget that banks are extremely useful in the real economy to finance lending to small, medium-sized companies. And therefore, you don't want to come with too stringent, too tough regulation because if you do that, well, either the cost of lending is going to go up massively, so the cost of bank loans to small firms will increase, or more likely, banks are going to push activities outside the bank. That was already happening in, before the crisis, 
So banks were using all kinds of vehicles, okay, the, the, the CDO's vehicle, were vehicles outside the banking community. They were not regulated, and that's really where the crisis started. So if you impose too strict regulation, it's a reaction. Banks are going to find tools to do business outside the bank. Then I want to come in, and I discuss in the paper what was always the fundamental role of banks, which is to borrow shorter, and that's good for depositors, and it is to lend long term to finance investment. What we do today with this very, very strict liquidity regulation, we are very, very much restricting the role of banks in transforming maturity. And in my opinion, it's wrong and it's not going to help. Let me give you well, to be well, precise. Hang on a second. It seems to me that that means that retail lending or any kind of lending would be severely curtailed, which would have another ripple effect on the economy. Or is that short? Exactly. Yeah. So, so lending would be, re would be very much curtailed. So this is, I think, very bad for the economy in particular, as we have a big recession today, I don't think the timing is appropriate to come with this very strict regulation. So for small, medium-sized companies, they will be very much affected, including consumer lending. And then, as I've said, banks will have an incentive okay, to move some of their business outside banks. Okay, maybe hedge funds that will start to do lending. And therefore, we are going to be back to where it was really the start of the crisis, to have one part of the system which is not regulated, from what you're saying, the regulations are just a little bit one-dimensional and, 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 and perhaps a little naive. The question indeed is, is what is the alternative? So I'm very convinced, and many economists are very convinced, that the, the root of the problem is that very large banks have benefited from the status of too big to fail. They know they are very big, they cannot default, so they receive systematic support from government. Because of that, they take too much risk. So. The issue that we must address, and that has not been addressed for the last 80 years, the issue that we must address is how, how can we put large banks into default? And there, because so this far, is what banks do. Banks do default at some point. I mean, it's not, it's not going to not happen again. No, but the, uh, but the problem is uh, that today, in most countries, we don't have a proper... No, they just collapse and everybody panics and then it's worse. Panic, panic and then even if you close a bank, the, the, the bankruptcy law in our countries are not really able to handle bank default. Because the problem is that you cannot simply close a bank like another company and say, we close the bank for six months, and then please come back in six months' time, we reopen the bank. Okay, you would kill the economy. So what countries are starting to work on is what they call resolution regime, mm -hmm. which means that before bankruptcy stage, so before the, the bank is bankrupt, okay, we want a system to recapitalize the banks. And, and this is where uh, there's been the debate about the so-called uh, contingent convertible bonds. The point I discuss in the paper is that, in my opinion, it is not only bondholders that should be put at risk, whether these are contingent convertible bonds, whether they are other bonds, what they want to call bail-in bonds, but in my opinion, all creditors should be put at risk. And why? Because on the banking market, all the banks are lending to one another. Banks are very active in lending to consumers, to corporations. So banks know very well what other banks are doing. So I take personally the view that the bank creditors are much better informed than bondholders. So the question as to which creditors should take the risk, whether it should be the bondholders or the holders of convertible bonds, whether it should be the bank creditors my view is to say, leave it to the market. But what you want to make clear is that if, if we go into a resolution regime, all creditors, maybe not the small depositors, but the bank creditors, the bondholders, all of them will be put at risk. Hey, let me end by asking you, what do you propose might enhance the soundness and the safety of banking markets? I mean, nothing's cast in gold, but what, what would you propose? So, 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 so coming back to the point, the point is uh, to make it clear. Uh, we, we, we end completely the too big to fail. So it is known to the world that any bank, large or small, can default. Again, technically, because we don't want to close the bank for six months, we have to put a, what they call a legal resolution regime where a party can intervene before default, imposing losses on the creditors. Okay, so all the creditors will be told as of tomorrow whether you are holder of, of a regular bond, whether you are holder of a convertible bond, whether you are holder simply interbank debt, you are going to be put at risk. And therefore, if the bank is in default, 
Okay, we will come to you and we will simply convert your debt into equity. I think this is the only solution, okay, to create incentive in the financial world to care much more about the risk taken by banks. I want all creditors, in particular the banks, to be put at risk so that they would be much more prudent in what they do. Right. What kind of reaction are you expecting to these hypotheses or these ideas? Well, first, there's, there's a, a tremendous today legal complexity because since banks are international, operate across border, uh, in particular with subsidiaries, uh, they are going to obey the law and the bankruptcy law, the resolution law of different countries. So there's a massive legal problem. How do we harmonize resolution regime around the world? And I kind of regret that three, four years after the crisis, we are moving so slowly into that direction. Number two, it is very, very clear. There is very strong opposition from the banking community. The banks do not want their interbank transaction to be put at risk. They want to put the risk to bondholders for obvious, obvious reason. And so I think as long as we are not attacking this problem, uh, we are going to have a gain crisis in the, in the future. Professor Jean Dumin, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you.